Hi, I'm Rachel Eric. I am a second year PhD student at the University of Wyoming. Um, I'm in Melanie Murphy's lab and my project deals with the Wyoming toad. The Wyoming toad is one of the most endangered amphibians in North America and we are out here today doing releases of captively bred individuals um, and putting them back into the wild so hopefully um, that can facilitate species recovery. Uh, for my project specifically, uh, we are putting transmitters onto Wyoming toads and tracking them after release. Uh, we will want to find out a little bit more about their movements, the types of habitats they're using, and how well they're surviving in the wild after release. We are going to apply a transmitter to this toad so we can track him after release. We are also going to take swabs for BD or chytrid fungus and then also um, take swabs to look at its microbiome. So that's just looking at the bacterial communities on the skin of the toad. And so the first thing we have to do is measure the toad um, for belting. Use the string to measure their waist, which is where the belt will go. The belts are designed to release as the toads grow. Um, we do have to readjust them periodically throughout the summer. We uh, track the toads using these transmitters, and the transmitters emit a signal that we can pick up with an antenna so we can track the toads. Chytrid is a fungal pathogen that has caused um, a lot of amphibian declines worldwide and even some extinctions. What we believe to be one of the primary reasons of decline in the Wyoming toad. So we'll be able to extract DNA from the samples in the lab here at University of Wyoming where we'll be able to tell the amount of chytrid that is on the boat. So I'm rinsing him with sterile water now to remove any transient bacteria. This is a swab for his microbiome, so it's just looking at um, bacterial communities on the toad. So there's uh, mounting evidence that bacterial communities associated with amphibian skin help provide some immunity um, or resistance to chytrid fungus. And so there's more and more research on how bacterial communities on amphibians and the chytrid fungus kind of interact. Um, and we're looking for potentially key bacteria that may help reduce uh, pathogen loads. So now we are releasing the toads um, into the wild. After we release them, we'll come back and try to relocate them once weekly and check to see how they're doing. We'll take their weight, SBL. Um, we'll also check their belt and make sure the belt is still fitting okay and working properly. Each of our relocations will take uh, samples for chytrid as well as uh, microbiome samples to kind of see how um, pathogen loads and disease status is shifting over time. So overall, we will release about 70 toads and track them throughout the summer. We will track them ideally until winter um, and try to follow them into hibernation to see what types of um, habitat they're choosing to hibernate in and then also monitor their overwinter survival. This video is brought to you by the University of Wyoming Biodiversity Institute, fostering appreciation and understanding of our natural world through science and education. The mountains and hills of the Cairngorms are battered by the most ferocious winds and bone-chilling temperatures in Britain. It can appear truly inhospitable. 
Yet there are some creatures that reign over these mountains. And perhaps the most iconic of these is the mountain hare. Mountain hare can thrive on the most heavily managed of Scottish land, grouse moors. Covered solely in heather, they have plentiful food, no animals to compete with, and only a few to fear. They spend their days huddled in forms, watching over our world and retaining heat. The harsh weather can be endless. Still, they stay steady and calm in their opportunistic shelters. mountain hare must always be alert, as this is not a land of bliss. It is the land of man and his gun. This is not their only threat. The mountain hare are creatures of camouflage and triggered by hormones, their fur will change colour to blend with the season. Brown in spring to white in winter. They will believe they are perfectly disguised and protected from those that have hair at the top of their menu. On a warming planet, the weather is not as it should be. Winters are milder, and without snow, their ingenious disguise now betrays them. Fur designed for Arctic conditions leaves the hares weak against the wind-driven rain and vulnerable to predators. Their survival through winter depends on snow. Once they are at the summit of hills and mountains, they cannot climb any higher. And so, they must sit and wait. For the time being, the weather can change in the blink of an eye, and just one night of snowfall can restore the mountain hare's world. They are free to enjoy this winter wonderland. Some make the most of this by stretching and dashing around, before returning to their favourite and familiar form. Others dig for heather and enjoy their meal with a view, but the ultimate luxury is a refreshing roll in the snow, a fur cleaning bath. are a testament to the remarkable strength of species to endure the harshest environments. They live on the edge of survival, with only ptarmigan and grouse accompanying them. But now their survival depends on us.
my name is Alfred, or you might call me Shungur. I am from the Maasai community, who are bordered to the National Staff Maasai Mara. My significant dressings in a reddish, this is first to an identity from the Maasai community. You dress in this manner so that uh, wild animals, you scare them to run away any times you are on the grazing field looking after your cattle. And the third one is courageous and bravery to scare the, 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 the opponent. Anytime they see two or three warriors, they think that we are under the us. Amran is like a soldier, and these are the people who are responsible to give the, the homestead and the community in general the security. When you are a boy, you don't wear red. But when you be become a warrior, you cannot dress fully red. You dress a half of you red. But when you become an elder, you cannot now wear like a warrior. As you know, the history about the Maasai, these are people who lived along the National Reserve, along the conservancies. About the Maasai and the wildlife, these are bond and adaptations which these people have lived with them from long times ago. A Maasai, you will not be allowed to eat wild meat. That's why you find these people live with wild animals. So they pass that education from one generation to another. Even though there's a conflict between them with big cats like lions and cheetahs and leopard, each and every animal in the Maasai community is more important because they name a certain family and uh, relate to a certain animal. Like elephants, it has a certain family which is related to. And now the young generation are now identifying some maternity places which elephants used to give birth. The populations of the Maasai people is increasing now and now and then. The young people are now trying to find a solution of trying to uh, protect such areas so that elephants can exist and live and can give birth. To wear it, to me personally, it gives me to think about my community like it's an identity. First to know who I am, where, where am I from, so that I can identify myself as a Maasai. The feature of the warriors is still on, we are still practicing, and we are still continuing transferring this from one generation to another, so that these young people, especially those who went to school, so that they cannot adapt other cultures of attire, so that they can come back for their identity and to practice this from one generation to another and from years and years to come.
Ονομάζομαι Χριστάκη Παναγιώτου, είμαι ο κενοτάρχη τη Δένια εδώ και μερικά χρόνια. Η Δένια είναι ένα χωριό μικρό που βρίσκεται μέσα στην νεκρή ζώνη εξ ολοκλήρου από το 1974. Γι' αυτόν τον λόγο υπήρξαν κάποια αρνητικά αποτελέσματα και έναν από αυτά ήταν η ανάπτυξη μεγάλου αριθμού τροχτικών και ευδοκιμούσα γιατί υπήρχε αρχαιολογικό χώρο με πολλούς λαξευτούς τάφους και κατοικούσαν εκεί. Τα τελευταία χρόνια τα τροχτικά ήταν τόσα πολλά, τα οποία είχαμε τεράστιες ζημιές. Δεν μπορούσαμε να ποτίσουμε τα χωράφια μας, έτρωγαν τα λάστιχα, δημιουργούσαν διάφορες ζημιές στα σύρματα. Είναι ευραίως γνωστό ότι η χρήση χημικών σκευασμάτων και συγκεκριμένα τροχτικοκτώνων είναι πάρα πολύ βραβερή για το περιβάλλον, επηρεάζει σε μεγάλο βαθμό την τροφική αλυσίδα και κατ' επέκταση τον άνθρωπο. Όταν εντοπίσαμε ότι υπήρχε το πρόβλημα με τα τροκτικά, έτυχε την ίδια περίοδο να γνωριστούμε και με τον φίλο μου, τον Χάρη Νικολάου, έναν εξαιρετικό επιστήμονα που μας βοήθησε να φάνταστα και μας εξήγησε ότι η καταπολέμηση των τροκτικών είναι πιο καλή να γίνει με τα ανθρωποπούλια. Πράγματι, ξεκινήσαμε εδώ και έξι χρόνια μαζί και σταδιακά βοηθήσαν και οι κρατικές υπηρεσίες, το τμήμα δασών, η υπηρεσία θύρας, το τμήμα γεωργίας και εφαρμόσαμε αυτό το πρόγραμμα στην κοινότητα με πολύ καλά αποτελέσματα. Το ανθρωποπούλι είναι ένα είδο κουκουβάγιας το οποίο έχει μια μεγάλη εξάπλωση σε όλο τον πλανήτη συναντάται σε όλες τις Υπήρους, πλήν της Ανταρκτικής. Στην Κύπρο είναι μία από τις πέντε κουκουβάγες που καταγράφονται στο, στο νησί. Ως νυχτόβιον αρπακτικών τρέφεται σχεδόν αποκλειστικά με τροχτικά. Αυτό προκύπτει από τις τιμονικές μελέτες τόσο από το εξωτερικό όσο και από δικές μας παρατηρήσεις. Ένα ζευγάρι ανθρωποπουλιών τρέφεται με 3.000-6.000 τροχτικά το χρόνο. Είναι ένα τεράστιο αριθμό και είναι αυτό που μα έχει οθήσει εδώ στην κοινότητα τη Δένεια, η οποία αντιμετώπιζε πρόβλημα τροχτικών, να χρησιμοποιήσουμε το ανθρωποπούλι ώστε να ελέγξουμε του πληθυσμού των, των τροχτικών που υπήρχαν στην κοινότητα. Η αναπαραγωγή περίοδο του ανθρωποπουλιού στην Κύπρο ξεκινά από τον Μάρτιο και ολοκληρώνεται γύρω στον Ιούνιο. Το ανθρωποπούλι στην Κύπρο αναπαράγεται μέσα σε κοιλότητε γκρεμών, μέσα σε εγκαταλελειμμένα κτίρια, μέσα σε πηγάδια, μέσα σε στέγε και γεννά περίπου 4 με 9 αυγά, τα οποία χρειάζονται 30 με 34 μέρε για να εκολαφθούν. Στην επόαση των αυγών συμμετέχει μόνο το θηλυκό, ενώ στη σύνδεση των νεοσών συμμετέχουν και οι δύο γονεί. Με τη χρήση καμερών παρακολούθησης βλέπουμε ότι ένα ζευγάρι ανθρωποπουλιών μπορεί να ταΐσει τα μικρά του μέχρι και 25 τροχτικά κάθε βράδυ. Θα ήταν ωφέλιμο να αναφέρω ότι αφού το ανθρωποπούλι τρέφεται σχεδόν αποκλειστικά με τροχτικά, κανέναν απλά θηρεύστημα ήδη δεν αποτελεί τροφή για το ανθρωποπούλι, ούτε ο λαγός, ούτε η περδικά, παρά μόνο οι αρουραίοι και οι ποντικοί. Θα ήταν παράληψη να μην αναφέρω ότι με το πρόγραμμα αυτό η κοινότητα έχει ωφεληθεί αφάνταστα. Έχουν σταματήσει τα δηλητήρια που βάζαμε συνεχώς στην κοινότητα και τώρα τη δουλειά των δηλητηρίων την κάνουν τα ανθρωποπούλια. Έχουμε δει μια πάρα πολύ μεγάλη διαφορά η οποία σπανίζει να δει στροχτικό να κυκλοφορεί ανεξέλεκτα, δηλαδή χωρίς φόβο. Υπάρχουν εξαιρετικά αποτελέσματα και αυτό μας ε, θάρρυνε να απευθυνθούμε και στις άλλες κοινότητες που είναι κοντά στο χωριό για να μπορέσουμε να δώσουμε και στα ίδια τα πουλιά τη διέξοδο να, να μετακινηθούν σε πιο κοντινές κοινότητες γιατί μόνο όφελος θα δούμε από αυτήν την δραστηριότητα.
bats are such intelligent animals. They're very curious about their environment and they're gentle, they're very social and communicative and they're just fascinating animals. The Idaho Department of Fish and Game is interested in bats and rabies because the department is the designated authority for wildlife in the state of Idaho and bats are part of that. So we want to raise awareness in the state of Idaho for people not only in the outdoors but in their homes to be aware that bats are part of the landscape. 6.8 and if we come into contact with them, understand what a rabies exposure is and when they need to just leave bats alone or how they need to respond, then we will have fewer bats having to be euthanized and tested for rabies when it's not necessary. Because they have some major threats right now from white nose syndrome and wind energy across the country and it's reduced their populations and they don't recover quickly. So we have to look at other things that we can do for bat conservation to protect our bats and keep people safe. The Idaho Department of Fish and Game Wildlife Health Lab addresses wildlife diseases. The rabies virus variant that we have in the state is bats. And so exposure to rabies is defined as a break in the skin, either through a bite or a scratch, or if I have an open wound on my hand and the bat licks my hand, there's potentially a way for the virus to get past my skin barrier. Or if I'm sleeping or I have an infant that's sleeping and I find a bat in the room, I don't necessarily know what happened. And that's, that's what constitutes exposure. In healthy bat populations, the, the actual numbers of animals that are affected by rabies is very, very low. But most people don't encounter bats in natural environments. Where they do encounter bats is in their homes, in their cabins, on their back patios. And most of those animals are either potentially doing normal things in abnormal places or potentially they're sick. Mm. One of the reasons they could be sick would be rabies. And if the bat is showing neurological signs or if there's an obvious exposure, then we have to euthanize this bat and get it tested for rabies. But what we're trying to do is pe make people aware that not all bats that are found in abnormal situations are rabid. We're trying to draw that distinction. And so if you're going to handle bats, be either vaccinated or have your personal protection equipment to minimize the risk so we don't have to endanger the bat's life. Because we'll sacrifice the bat for human health. Some of those animals come here to the Wildlife Health Laboratory where we would either conduct a necropsy or at least obtain the specimens that we need to to send on to the Idaho Bureau of Laboratories to do the rabies testing. So when an animal comes to the State Public Health Laboratory for testing, the brain is examined. And if we have a positive test result, then that person who submitted the animal is alerted to the test results right away. They're encouraged to seek medical treatment immediately with their healthcare provider because now you have an actual rabies exposure and rabies is almost 100% fatal. So people really need to get the shots to prevent this deadly disease. And thankfully now there's only one or two human rabies cases across the country every year. Now it's a very small percentage of bats that have rabies, but they are the number one species that uh, we encounter with rabies. But bats are very beneficial to the environment. They play an important role in consuming a lot of insects that also cause disease in people, like eating mosquitoes that cause West Nile virus. So they play a really beneficial role in the environment. And if we minimize exposure to bats, we are minimizing the number of bats that have to be euthanized okay, and tested. So it, it's important to understand that public health and conservation goals can work in harmony together in order to protect people, protect bats, and avoid rabies. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention 
serves as the National Rabies Surveillance Program. So all of our state partners annually submit uh, all of their rabies testing data to us to try to paint a picture of the status of rabies across the entire United States. Rabies is primarily transmitted by a bite. It's entirely fatal, but it's also entirely preventable. Luckily in the United States, we have a very robust health system that does provide ready access to vaccines. So if you receive it appropriately, you will not go on to develop disease. So One Health is a combination of our animals, people, and the environment in which we share. And it's the acknowledgement that there are diseases that animals have, there are diseases that people have, and there are conditions and even diseases that exist in the environment that can impact all of us. And so rabies is one of the prime examples of One Health in action. It's an important issue for both human health and animal health, right. wildlife and domestic. So One Health is the way to bring in experts from all of these different fields that can bring their own knowledge and skills and experience to try to come up with preventive health measures that can address the whole picture instead of just one piece of this puzzle. Work out all of the duplication. Wildlife are best left alone. If you see a sick or strange acting bat, it's most important that you immediately notify a health authority or animal control who will have the proper protective wear and probably a history of rabies vaccination to safely assess that bat and see if it can be rehabilitated or if it needs to be humanely euthanized due to its, its condition. And bat rehabilitators are kind of the front line of our public health system. They're an important group to make sure they are educated about not only the, the risks of rabies in bats, but also the necessity of reporting potential exposures to our health departments that can conduct a rabies risk assessment. Bat World Sanctuary is the only facility in the world that is dedicated to rehabilitation, rescue, and lifetime sanctuary for orphaned, ill, and injured native and non-native bats. And we have a really strong relationship with the Texas Department of State Health Services. We routinely report if we find a bat that we suspect is rabid. We report information that they need to follow up with citizens that may have been exposed. And when a bat is found on the ground, if the individual who finds it picks it up barehanded, bat is frightened, it bites, we as rehabilitators have no recourse except to euthanize the animal and send it for testing to determine whether or not it's rabbit. And most of the time they come back negative. And those are lives lost. On top of that, we're losing millions of bats to white nose syndrome. We're losing hundreds of thousands of bats per year to wind turbines. And then we're adding insult to injury by needlessly having to test bats for rabies because we didn't think. And it's a very simple matter to protect them and protect ourselves by not handling a bat barehanded and getting it to a qualified rehabilitator as quickly as possible. But it's important to remember this. It's not possible to get rabies because a bat flew by. It is not possible to be infected with rabies because you touched a bat that was on the ground with the toe of your shoe. Exposure to rabies means that Infected saliva or central nervous system fluid or tissues has been introduced into the body with direct contact to blood or mucous membranes from an animal that is actively shedding the virus in order to be at risk of contracting the disease. So the very best protection is for the person who finds the bat to not touch it barehanded and not try to care for it themselves, but get it to somebody immediately who can help. Be responsible, protect yourself, and protect them. It's that simple.
Gibraltar, a British overseas territory at the southern tip of Spain, home to just 30,000 Gibraltarians. I have travelled here to explore its world-renowned tourist attraction. Gibraltar's Barbary macaques are the only free-roaming monkeys in Europe. The original macaques came from the Atlas Mountains of Morocco and Algeria. Now, just across the sea, around 230 of them occupy Gibraltar's Upper Rock Nature Reserve. Although the environment here is very similar to the Rocky Mountains in North Africa, these macaques have become very different from their wild counterparts in more than just location. I'm here to find out just how much tourism impacts them. Thousands of tourists visit Gibraltar's Upper Rock Nature Reserve each day. The macaques don't seem to mind being surrounded by people. Instead, they see it as an opportunity. Every day, they have ample opportunity to steal food from unsuspecting tourists. But often, the best skill to master is patience. These creatures are wild animals both free and will bite if provoked. So please do not touch or feed them and be careful not to take out any food. The Gibraltar monkeys get fed every day by the authorities. But they know that where there are tour guides, there is food. Illegal feeding happens constantly, especially by the people who work at the nature reserve. This doesn't set a good impression for the tourists, and rules are very often ignored even by those who are visiting the nature reserve for the first time. The macaques here are even trained to do tricks to impress tourists. Many tourists and locals might not be aware of the ways that they could be impacting the macaques. I spoke to Brian Gamilla, a primatologist and tour guide at the Nature Reserve. He runs private educational macaque outings and observes these monkeys on a regular basis. What you need to understand is that when the prospect of food handouts is there, that creates a bit of an anxiety, shall we say, amongst the monkeys. When there's a prospect of food, you have higher incidence of fidgeting behavior, shall we say, scratching, general unrest. And these behaviors collectively are known as self-directed behaviors, and they can be used as indices of anxiety. These macaques, they are folivorous, which means they eat foliage, leaves, and obviously the way they come across their natural food is in a very dispersed manner. In contrast, when people offer them food handouts, irregardless of what that food may be, this food, which is concentrated and more importantly clumped, will elicit competition amongst the monkeys. And depending on the monkey's ranks, the more, let's say, subordinate ones will be anxious at the fact that if they were to grab hold of any of these handouts, they will be likely to be chased by a more dominant monkey. I can partly understand the lure of having a close encounter with a wild animal, but there are repercussions. 
Not all of the macaques in the nature reserve are affected by tourists in this way. This is because their territories are not located in and around the tourist hotspots. In 2003, a group of macaques separated from their troop in the tourist hotspot and claimed a new territory just outside the nature reserve. The monkeys were drawn to this area because of a different kind of food source. This troop feeds off Gibraltar's refuse tip. It might seem as though this huge mound of rubbish has simply replaced a tourist hotspot. But in fact, being around tourists has a greater impact on their well-being. Just by observations, it wouldn't appear as though feeding off the rubbish tip elicits as much competition as, in fact, food handouts do. It comes down to them managing their time better. There's particular peak times for tourists, usually in and around midday-ish. And if you're a monkey, if you miss that time, then you haven't got your daily fix of treats. Whereas with the rubbish tip, it's always kind of there. There's an abundance, so they can kind of make trips every now and again, and they can manage the day better, almost as if they were foraging. It is clear that Gibraltar's Barbie macaques suffer as a result of the current behaviour at the nature reserve. But tourists can still enjoy close encounters without providing food handouts or interacting with them. These world-famous monkeys are a symbol of Gibraltarian pride and one of the top tourist attractions here. But the outdated practices in the nature reserve can portray Gibraltar in a poor light. There has to be incentives to be able to deliver a more sustainable, more educational, less intrusive um, macaque experience. These are the only non-human primates free living in the whole of Europe. There's much, much more to them than seeing one sat on a wall or even perched on somebody's shoulders. Plus, it's ever so much more rewarding to see these monkeys in the natural environment. It may be humans who have drastically changed the way these monkeys live. But it is humans who have the power to reverse this impact. One of nature's most extraordinary journeys begins with this tiny blue egg. The eggs measure just over half a millimetre, the size of a pinhead, and are barely visible to the naked eye. 
Inside is a caterpillar who will undergo one of the most mysterious transformations found in nature. The mother has laid 500 eggs, yet only 10 of these will survive. At one and a half millimetres in size, even the tiniest obstacle becomes a challenge to the hungry caterpillar. The caterpillar is an eating machine and consumes over a hundred different types of food plants. Chemical sensors around the caterpillar's mouth allow it to sense which plants are safe to eat. Its body is covered with short hairs that are connected to nerve cells. These hairs are incredibly touch sensitive and allow the caterpillar to feel the world around them. They see the world around them through six tiny eyes that can only differentiate between light and dark. With such primitive eyesight, it must swing its head from side to side to judge depth and distance. The caterpillar prefers to feed on the underside of the leaf, where it may be safer from predators. To keep from falling off, it uses silk to attach itself to the plant. When the caterpillar is fully grown, it undergoes metamorphosis, the greatest transformation found in nature. This transition occurs over a series of stages. First, the caterpillar finds a spot to rest. Here it builds a silk pad and suspends itself from the plant. Next, the caterpillar sheds its skin to reveal the chrysalis it has been growing underneath. The chrysalis will then harden to protect the transformation happening inside. Very little is known about what happens inside the chrysalis, and now, through these X-ray scans, we can see for the first time the incredible transformation within. The first extraordinary discovery was that the caterpillar releases enzymes that digest almost its entire body into a protein-rich soup. Only a few groups of cells survive this process, 
and these cells go on to use the soup of the digested caterpillar to develop into the new organism. After the first day, the breathing tubes are already well formed. As the organism develops, the breathing tube system will continue to branch. This extraordinary time lapse shows the forming of the wings inside the chrysalis. In the final stages of development, we can see the colour coming into the membranes of the wings. After one week, the world's most amazing phenomenon is complete, and what was once a caterpillar emerges as a new creature. By dividing life into two parts, each form can perform different roles. The adult butterfly can now fly, allowing her to leave her birthplace to find new food and a mate. This individual will also fly two and a half thousand miles to Africa to escape the harsh British winters. To do this, she must first find nectar. Unlike her time as a caterpillar, she now has eyes that are made up of 10,000 lenses, allowing the butterfly to see colour. This lets her find flowers to feed on. Painted lady butterflies use their tongues, or proboscis, to reach deep into the flower. All this intricate anatomy was created inside the chrysalis, from a simple eating machine who underwent the most incredible transformation found in nature. Metamorphosis. It is hard to see the jaguar. 
My grandfather took me out to the forest. We would walk along the trail, listening to the birds. Sometimes we would see tracks of jaguars in the forest. But the animal itself, it's so hard to see. So he would tell me stories. And this is a story that I still remember now. I'm originally from the Netherlands, which is a place where everything is managed. There, there is no wilderness anymore. In a wild place like Belize, jaggers decide their own fate. They decide where they live. They decide where they roam in these vast forests that are here. And I like to keep it like that. My name is Bart Harbson and I am a Jagger researcher. To have prey, water coverage, to have exchange of genes, Jagger populations need large amounts of land, prime habitat. This morning, we're gonna be talking a little bit about something very close to my heart, the Maya Forest Corridor. This corridor is key to connecting our protected area system. This is basically the last remaining gateway for those animals. Here in Belize, we got Selva Maya in the north. And on the other side of that, we have the Maya Mountains, which is prime jaguar habitat. And there's a stretch along the Western Highway that connects these two. The Maya Forest Corridor. It's an essential bottleneck. If we lose that, two areas become isolated, potentially causing extinction of Jagger populations. I believe that the window of opportunity for us to, to, to get this right, to manage to secure connectivity in this area, is still open, but it's closing fast. This corridor has been shrinking. All of this area was a stronghold for both prey and jaguars. After this was converted to sugarcane, we've lost the ability for animals to move from northern Belize through this particular section. There were points when we lost up to 20,000 acres of forest at once. Ten years ago, jaguars could freely move across between these two areas. It's now reduced to a stretch of only five kilometers wide. If it changes into a barrier of monoculture agriculture, jaguars don't move through that. We are really out of time. We really need to band together to save this area. We're not making it up as we go along about this corridor. We have the proof that this is actually the place where this is working. The pattern on a pelt of a jagger is like a fingerprint. There's no other jagger that has the same pattern. You can actually follow jaggers around if they're photographed in different locations. That's how we found out that the Mayan Forest Corridor is actually working. This is that bird is saying it feels so good. That's the short-billed pigeon. <laughs> yeah. It's starting to open up. Okay, so welcome to Runaway Creek. It's a critical part of the Maya Forest Corridor. In this reserve, there are a lot of caves, and I'm going to set a camera in the cave, a trail camera. I'm pretty sure we'll see wildlife there. Camera traps, it's like a camera with a sensor attached to it. So whenever something walks in front of it, it makes a picture of it. Uh, a person, a pig, and a jagger. We can just put these passive monitors all across the landscape to find out where all these animals are going. The jaguar is very powerful. They're very silent, they're very shy. Powerful animals, yeah. Pig is right ahead. I'm a Maya person, I'm a Kekchi Maya. 
The ancient Mayas believed that the entrance to the underworld are caves. The jaguar, it was their main god. He's the sun god during the day, but during the evening, it will transform itself into the form of a jaguar to, to go through the underworld. And in the morning, it will come out as the sun again. I'm going to set a camera. This is an infrared camera. It doesn't flash. Delay, eight, seven, six, five, four. If you pay a lot of attention, you can learn some important lessons from the past. My name's Jaime Awe. I've been doing archaeology since I was nine years old. In our study of ancient Maya civilization, we, we know it collapsed. What happened to this unbelievable civilization? We, we know today there were some major droughts taking place around the time of the Maya collapse. Now, what exacerbates drought? Deforestation. That forest and those savannas and those wetland systems are meant to capture water. Intensive farming. What are you selling? You are converting all of your forests that give you biodiversity, that give you clean water, that give you tourism. And you are sacrificing all of that for selling raw product at a cheap bulk price. Over a long period, the Maya could not sustain themselves. And one would hope that by learning those important lessons from the past, we're not going to repeat them. We'll check the camera. 7th of April at 5.02 p.m. It's a Jaguar. It's a Jaguar. You can see these are pictures actually right from the corridor. The science has been done. It doesn't get any clearer than this. If we don't do anything to save that corridor, it's going to disappear. I am convinced that we would have to purchase some of that land and protect it in order for it to actually persist for the long term. And we are talking about something of big impact. It cannot be done by one person. We have called on a coalition of partners. We have our local partners on the ground. And we have international partners. This is the number one cause for the decline of jaguar deforestation. And we have the people, right? The people in those communities. In the long term, we have to find somewhere to create jobs for the villagers. Educate them and train them how to help us in the corridor to protect the animals. We have the government of Belize. The government and my ministry in particular stands committed to enshrining legislation and whatever we need to do to ensure that we maintain the integrity of this area well into the foreseeable future. Why does, um, why does a biologist become a politician? That's a good question. Some would say temporary insanity. <laughs> <laughs> you spend a lot of time in the field working, uh, studying jaguars, uh, trying to do what you can to protect them. But at some point, that will reach to the desk of the policy makers. If we want to develop sustainably, if we want to pass down a belief similar to the one that we inherited, the government can do a lot. And I am very hopeful that the Maya Forest Corridor will in the future stand out uh, as an example, not only to the region, but perhaps to the planet on how it can be done. Do you miss your office? Not really. <laughs> you more miss out here. I don't want to go back now. For me, it's personal. I grew up in uh, northern Belize, in a village in the Corozal district. What my parents and my grandparents did for a living was work in the sugarcane industry. Over time, I have seen how some of that has gone. And at some point, we have to ask ourselves, what are you losing? I was always 
interested in cats and reading stories about cats. Not knowing where Belize was, I ordered a ticket. And the whole story came to life. It's a magical place. Everybody tells you you're never ever going to see a jaguar. You're just going to walk around here, you're going to see footprints, you're going to be in the land of the jaguar, but you're not going to see them. It is hard to see the jaguar. It was usually my grandfather. He would tell me stories. Yeah, he's deceased now. But I would wish future generations will have the opportunity to see what I've seen. This is a story that I still remember now. I'm Olai. And I'm walking up a little hill. I'm Olai. Suddenly I'm face to face with a jaguar. And it starts spinning to your head. Your own existence, the existence of the world that you're in. There's something way stronger than you there. There's something that is incredibly powerful that is right there. And it's looking at you. When it goes in the darkness, that's night. And in the morning, it will come out as the sun again. This is an opportunity to act for generations of wildlife populations and generations of Belizeans. Think about our collective power. If we could all come together each of us bringing our strength, working together to make this corridor a reality.